But I think the main thing is not so much how the exact fight is going to be, but that you have in you the willingness to be a warrior for the things you know are properly yours to fight for. And it's a, it's a spirit. It's an attitude. Um, and it's one that I, I drank in uh, by being around a lot of military guys early in my life. And then as I got older, I was with a lot of really solid men of God, a lot of really solid uh, leaders, and, and I've always been next, very close to military culture because I, I speak a lot, do a lot in the military, lecture at the Naval Academy, and so on. And so, uh, all of that to say that, uh, that that keeping that warrior spirit alive, even the books you read, uh, feeds into that, uh, is really really critical. And, and it's something that many men have to awaken because it's they've been talked out of it in our in our kind of cubicle, uh, docile, don't touch that kind of age. You know. Episode number one hundred seven. You can grab the show notes and resources by going to dadhackers.us slash 107. What's up, Dad Hackers? My name is Patrick Antonucci, and I am the host and founder of this podcast and community of Dad Hackers. Well, Dad Hackers is a community of Christian fathers who are devoted to encouraging, equipping, and enabling one another to become the men that God has created and called us to be so that we can raise up the next generation of fully devoted followers of Christ and leave a legacy of multi-generational faithfulness. Now, on this show, we primarily interview Christian men to dive deep into their experiences and insights into what it means to be a Christian man, a Christian husband, a Christian father, and a Christian leader. We ask questions that dig deep into the thinking and rationale and experiences of these men so that we can all learn and grow into the men that God is calling us to be. I'm so thankful that you've joined us today. Make sure you subscribe so that you never miss any of our value-packed episodes. Also, please make sure you leave an honest review if you're listening to this in iTunes or any other platform that takes reviews. Reviews boost the show's ratings, which means that more dads are going to come across our show and benefit from the content that we put out. I also wanted to let you know that we do have a free private Facebook group just for Christian dads. So after the show, make sure you hop on over to the show notes. There's a link for that in there as well. Stephen, thanks for joining us, man. How are you? Man, it's a privilege. I'm doing well, bunkered in and with a good woman and happy. So I'm all, all's well. Yeah, man, I hear you. Quarantine life. We were talking about that before we hit record. I'm bunkered down myself with my wife and kids and, uh, trying to make the most of it and look at the opportunities that this situation presents, trying to have that kind of mindset going into this. Smart way to go. Smart way to go. Yeah, man. Yeah. So let's jump right in. How about you introduce yourself and then uh, we'll, we'll get right into some stuff about your new book you have coming out. Great. I appreciate it. I'm probably best known as a New York Times bestselling author. I've written uh, The Faith of George W. Bush, The Faith of Barack Obama, Lincoln's Battle with God, other books like that. So I'm sort of known as a biographer with an eye towards faith. Um, I am an outspoken advocate for the Kurds, uh, do a lot of lobbying and speaking and international work for the Kurds, uh, and also obviously very passionate about men. So my, my main work life is as an author and a speaker, doing that all over the world. I own a couple of companies based in D.C. that largely coach people to speak well. And you can imagine that's a real need in, in D.C. So every time somebody runs for office or every time somebody leaves government to go into the private sector, they want to be coached. And so I, that, that's what we do. So it's a good life. It's a busy life. And then my wife and I together run a company um, that uh, creates and manages literary projects for big publishers and celebrities and things like that. So a good life, largely about books, literature, speaking, and then a lot of politics. So I'm, that's what I do. But, of course, I'm here because I... I've written three books about men and I'm passionate about the cause of men in our generation. Right on, man. And that's why I brought you on the show because I, I really like, really appreciated the book you wrote on manliness and the, the four maxims you have in there. Really got a lot out of that book. I'm currently also going through your uh, ebook on building a band of brothers and that's some good content there. And the main reason I brought you on, of course, is to talk about manhood and manliness because this is the Dad Hackers podcast, of course, and we're all about becoming the men that God has called and created us to be. And so your new book that's coming out, Men on Fire, man, it's lighting me up. And I'm only halfway through it so far. And I've just got like half the book highlighted, man. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just raring to go on it. So I, I thought we dive. You're writing in that book? 
You're putting marks in my book. Yes. <laughs> I'm just I, playing. I've got notes in there. I've got highlights. I haven't dog-eared anything. I'm not, I'm not that sacrilegious. No, no, man. You can go, you do what you want. I'm just messing <laughs> with you. I know. I know. Um, so yeah, l- let's dive right in. And by the way, we're going to be doing a giveaway for Mansfield's book here. If you want to be entered into the drawing for a free copy of his new Men on Fire book, what you need to do is you need to share this episode on social media, tag myself, and also make sure you go and follow Stephen uh, out on social media as well. And I'll link everything up in the show notes so that's really easy. You just tap or click on all that stuff and it'll be ready for you to go. But if you want to be entered into the drawing for a free copy of the book, make sure you share the post on social media, share the podcast rather, and tag myself and tag Stephen as well. So in what ways, Stephen, in, in your mind, how is culture warping this idea of manhood? Yeah, I, I, feel, I feel for men these days because our society sends certain messages and then when men act on those messages, when they act on that philosophy, then society wants to punish them for it. So society mm-hmm. shoves porn at them, Society shoves, you know, rowdy, drunken, crazed behavior. Uh, society sh- emphasizes in its media and so on, uh, you know, treating women a certain way, regarding women as sexual objects, etc. Uh, then society becomes upset with men and talks about toxic masculinity and, uh, and speaks ill of them as, as men and talks about how manhood in itself is toxic uh, because men have absorbed the lessons of society. So my whole goal is to get men to realize the messages that have been shaping them and turn to a higher, a loftier message of, of what manhood ought to be and get them to quiet the messages that are coming from the society. But, you know, if I was, a, I mean, I'm a little older now, but if I was in my you know, teens right now, I'd be freaking confused. You want me to look at porn. Uh, you want me to think, porn teaches me to think of every woman as wanting it, whether she acts like it or not. Um, you know, you want me to be, live from my penis, you know, and live from my crotch and, and be rowdy and drink heavily and, and go partying all the time. Um, you want me to be violent. You want me to, you know, et cetera. But, but then you punish me for it and then act as though I'm some kind of sociopath when I do that. So I, I would be very, very confused. Fortunately, I had some better models in my life. But, but I think that that's, that's the tension most men find themselves in. Yeah, right. And you, you mentioned this idea of the idiot man and the dog man, and you, you kind of touched on those without using that phraseology. Can you, can you explain that those two concepts of the man? Yeah, these are two words that I use. Uh, dog man is the guy who uh, spends his life sitting at the pole, shoving 20s into some guy's underwear, and doesn't have any life apart from that. He's a guy who's riddled by lust. He's a guy who's all about sexual conquest. And by the way, he's the guy who was helping to create the fact that on college, American college and university campuses, 20% of all women are sexually abused. Well, who's doing that? You know, unfathered, untethered misbehaving men uh, who basically are dog men. Then there's idiot man. And idiot man makes me angry because I'm a little older than you. And so, you know, that that whole image that we see on TV all the time of the idiot dad, the idiot middle-aged guy, the idiot guy, uh, you know, the guy, the the father who in the house who finds the remote control in the couch and does a happy dance, you know, and his wife and kids are in the kitchen rolling their eyes at how stupid he is. We see that image all the time. So you either have idiot man or you have dog man. And both of them are just disgusting. And I'm not either one of those men. You're not either one of those men. Most men aren't either one of those men. But that's the image of manhood that's presented in our generation. Hmm. So you mentioned that the concept of unfathered, untethered men. Can you tease that out a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, I realize that many of us don't have, didn't have fathers in the home or good fathers in the home. Uh, but a man who's allowed uh, his lack of fathering to define his life negatively a man who hasn't reached to other good men to come into his life and be father figures and coach him, a man who hasn't looked for mentors, uh, he's going to have a pretty deep father wound. I know that sounds all trendy and psychological, but that's, that's exactly what it is. Um, it's living untethered. It's living without restraint. It's living without a, a model for noble manhood. It's, it's living without any image of what a man ought to be. And so unfathered and untethered, man. Untethered means that you don't, you're not connected to anybody. You don't feel any obligation to anyone. You have a lone wolf basically out there in society. So the unfathered lone wolf is the guy who, you know, not in every case, but in some cases is the rapist and the thief. He's the guy who's abusing people. He's the guy who's getting high, getting rowdy, doing damage. Doesn't have any principles, doesn't have any character, doesn't have any pillars, doesn't have any morals, doesn't have any code. And all of those things are things that we need. So I'm not down on guys who didn't have a father in the home. 
uh, you know, I had actually a split situation. I had a very noble, heroic, high-ranking U.S. officer as my father. Um, and so he, he offered a lot that I could model my life on, a lot that inspired me. But at the same time, he had almost no ability to communicate with his son. I, I, you know, I, had to teach, I had to get some other guy to teach me how to shave, for heaven's sakes. I had to get some other guy in my, in my teen years to teach me how to change the oil in a car. My father could not sit down and say, no, son, this is what a man does. I love you. I'm going to teach you these things. I'm going to whoop you when you misbehave. But it's because I love you and I want to help you be, you know, be a good man. He couldn't do that. He'd go out. He'd, he'd win medals. He'd fight. He'd be a war hero. He'd fight in Vietnam. He'd be fighting in Korea. Um, and that was when I was, before I was even born. Um, you know, he'd serve nobly, he'd uh, command battalions, he'd be, he'd be in the Cold War and in intelligence and all that, he was a Russian linguist and all that. But he couldn't come home, put his arm around me and say, how was your day, son? I love you. He couldn't pull that off. So I had a, an, a, an over, over noble, overbearing kind of image on the one hand, and then on the other hand, had a father who was absentee. So I can at least feel a little bit after the guys who have no father in the home. But we got to, all got to realize that whatever gap in fathering we had, no matter how much our fathers may have tried, the fact is it leaves us a little bit damaged. Now, that, the point of saying that is not so we can blame them and be bitter. Mm -hmm. The point of saying that is so we can recognize what's going on in our souls that will affect the way we live that out. So what, what kind of steps did you take to kind of course correct in your life, being that you, you had a noble, noble father figure, but he wasn't necessarily playing the role in your life that you needed. I know this is a huge question, so maybe like a bullet point, point or two. Uh, what, what did you do to, to tweak that, to correct it, to get what you needed? Well, the, the, the good news about Stephen Mansfield is that he'll roar after the information and the input that he needs. You know, like I'm like, I'm like a vacuum. If I need to know something, if I need to understand something, if I need, need help, I'll go get it. So along about the age, age of 18, I went off to a very good university and I just went and got found older guys. I just went and talked to older guys. And I said, look, I had a father who's a war hero and you know, pictures in the Pentagon and blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, he couldn't teach me how to shave. He couldn't teach me, teach me what to do with my penis. He couldn't te teach me what to, you know, how to, he couldn't talk to me about anything. So will you tell me some things? Yeah, let me ask you some questions. And these were good older guys who didn't embarrass me and put me down. They answered my questions. So I began, to put it in short, I asked, I began to solicit mentors. I began to ask guys to be my older brothers. Uh, older brothers taught me how to study. Older brothers taught me how to, how to dress. Older brothers taught me, you know, almost everything about being a man. And um, my father, you know, if he was sitting here right now, I'd be surprised by that because he thinks, he, I'm sure he's dead now, but he would, he would certainly have thought he was the archetypical man when he, when he was in the home, the ideal man. And in many ways, he was. But it's not enough to be a model. You have to communicate it. So the way that I answered that was I went after information. I read. I studied. I learned. And I went and found good men. If I saw, uh, when I was a freshman in college, if I saw a guy who was a senior who I thought was exemplary and had real character and really carried himself well and did certain things well, I'd say, let me take you to lunch, teach me. So I'd have guys teach me stuff over lunch, maybe four lunches, I don't know, but uh, it cost me a lot of money, but I mean, it, you know, I was able to buy a lot of hamburgers and, and learn some things. So that's, that's the basis of my book, Building Your Band of Brothers, is you gotta be intentional in this generation and pull men into your life uh, who, who can coach you and confront you and challenge you about the things you need and you can do the same for them. Yeah. I see in your explanation there, the, this overarching principle kind of of rejecting passivity and, and taking some action. And on, on a couple levels, number one, the information gathering phase whereby you go out and seek the information you need. And a lot of guys are really good at that. We yeah. don't have any excuse with the age of the internet. I mean, there's, it's just all at your fingertips exactly. and most of it's for free or a minimal investment and you could get all the information to keep you busy. But the next step is actually taking action on that information. And I think that's where a lot of guys tend to fall short because you get, for a whole host of reasons, but you, you get stuck in that information gathering phase. And so it was good to hear you go through that and talk about how you went and gathered the information, sought out the other guys and uh, then took action on those things. So what, what's the opposite or the, the man that we're trying to create? You talked about the untethered, the unfathered, the lone wolf type of guy. Well, that's what we don't want to be. Like, what are we striving for? What are we aiming for? Well, we're aiming to be guys, first of all, and I'm not trying to preach here, but who are connected to God. God created manhood. 
uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to turn this into a religious thing, but I mean, I, a, lot of, a lot of what happened for me was that I became a Christian when I was 18, connected to God, realized he had a higher, he, that he created manhood, and um, that he had a, had a pur- purpose for me as a man. And so there was something good and pure and noble about being a man that I wanted to uncover that I had not lived for the first 18 years of my life. Then second of all, um, you have to have a code. A man lives by a code. He lives by a behavioral code. Women are treated a certain way. A man needs a certain level of controlled rowdiness. Um, you know, here's what happens when a man gets angry. Here's what happens when a man hurts. You got to be able to you have a code. You got to have principles by which you live, the way you treat people, the, uh, recognizing the power of your words, recognizing the power of your physical strength and using it for noble reasons. That's what all that, that, that a manly code is about. And then third of all, for me, it's about building a band of brothers. Um, so, the, so the kind of men we want to be uh, are men who are living out the noble code of righteous, great, noble manhood, but they're doing it embedded in a band of brothers. So that's, that's what we want to be. And that, that then, uh, you know, begins to filter out in every other area of my life. Uh, notice that I'm not even talking about being a husband or a father. Uh, or even a professional, because if that's what I am at heart, connected to God, living out the noble code of righteous manhood, and doing it with, embedded in a band of brothers, then my life, my characters, uh, and that manly vision is going to flow out into everything else that I do. So that's the heart of it right there. I mean, obviously, you and I could talk for 10 years about what, what noble manhood looks like, and we, we probably should. Uh, but the fact is that those are the three things that really define me, and that I think define a good man. Um, you know, where, 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 where are you with God? Where are you in terms of a manly code? And where are you in terms of embedded in a band of noble brothers? That, that, that defines almost all of it. And and so that's, that's how I approach it. So in your book, you talk about these seven fires that burn in a man's soul. And what's so compelling about fire? Why fire? Why, why use that? Um, I had written the two books that you already mentioned, Mansfield's Book of Manly Men and Building Your Band of Brothers. And I felt like, though I was grateful for everything that had come from those books and the impact it was having on men, that I had left something out. And it was the fact that I didn't want empty men living out a moral code. I didn't want just men trying to behave themselves. You know, I mean, I hate the kind of approach to manhood training that goes, don't touch that, (laughs) you know, basically. Uh, So... I began to realize that what, what was really missing in a lot of men, even men who had read my books, other good books, had been to conferences, et cetera, learned what they needed to learn, was the fire. What was the fire? What really, what really distinguished the men that I loved uh, and the men that I admired? And it was fire. It was, it was a passion. It was a zeal from the inside. It was a dynamo on the inside. Uh, so I began to identify what that was. Now, that was, that was obviously present in my other books. I'm not saying they were empty of that imp- information and perspective. But when I, when I really identified the seven fires, that's when I really put my finger on what needs to be restored in most men. I don't want empty men going around just behaving themselves. I don't want empty men just saying, yes, dear, you know, and calling that good manhood. I don't want that. Um, I want men on fire. I want men passionate. I want men large and bold and living passionately in life and roaring after life and doing it with a band of brothers and serving their communities and making a difference in the world. And that comes from inner fire. So you know, having read classical literature, having read some of the writings of the great leaders throughout history, all of them talked about inner fire. So I decided to use that image for how to talk about these, these seven forces that ought to work in a man's soul. Yeah, it makes me think of, I, I can't remember if it's Isaiah or Jeremiah, maybe one of the other prophets that, that talks about how he just needed to speak the word of God because it was a fire in his bones. Fire in his bones, yes. Yeah, I can't remember the exact prophet, but... No, no, that's okay. Uh, But I mean, you you know, if I'm talking to you, let's say you're some guy who's just now stepping into noble manhood, you're just starting to think about it. I don't want to drag you along, you know, okay, here's what you have to do next, you know, and you're dragging along, and this is what I got to do to be good. I don't want God to torch me, you know, kind of attitude. And... Uh, I want you to be on fire, man. I want you to roar after it. I want you to be inflamed. I want, to, I, want, I want noble manhood to be like fire shut up in your bones, as the prophet said. So all of that to say, um, but bringing that to men, I think is important. Plus, by the way, when we get a little bit into what the seven fires are, we're going to understand that a lot of this is about looking at your own circumstances, looking at mm-hmm. your own heritage, looking at your own life, and seeing where you already have the stuff, the the the, well, let's, let's call it the material to build a, a fire in your soul. Um, and that's what I wanted to coach men to do. Not just, I didn't want to just say, come be a noble man like I'm trying to be. I wanted to say, you've already got the building blocks of that in your own life. Let me show you how to do this. 
Yeah, I think a lot of guys have it within themselves, like you said, and, and maybe that fire has been extinguished. Maybe there's a wet blanket on it. A whole host yes, of things. Absolutely. I'd like to park on this uh, this fire of destiny that you talk about, or excuse me, the, the, this um, fire of, of the warrior spirit. Um, how would you define the warrior spirit within man? Uh, I believe in a man, there needs to be a recognition, first of all, that he is a warrior, that whether we're talking about spiritually, emotionally, actually on battlefields in the world, for those he loves, uh, contending, that that needs to be part of his inner fire, that needs to be part of his inner passion, that needs to be part of his equipping and training and preparation. Um, and so if a man thinks of himself as going to battle, and I think that's been beaten out of most men. You know, if you've been sexually abused, if you've been beaten down by a critical parent, if you've been um, abused in other ways in your life, or if you've been talked out of that, if, if, we, if you were rowdy on the playground in elementary school, and I'm not picking on them, but a female teacher said, behave yourself, stop that, calm down all the time, if that was the message, well, then, then you lost the sense of inner fire. But, but, but men need to contend. Men need to be in sports. Men need to be, have that controlled violence of athletics. They need to go out on the wild a little bit. And this feeds uh, that warrior spirit. Now, it doesn't make them violent. It doesn't mean you've got a whole room stacked up with weapons, you know, and all that kind of stuff. It just means that you are ready to contend. You can contend in prayer. You can contend for the emotional safety of people. You can contend for your kids where you need to. You got some fight in you. You got some get up and go. You got some stand. You know, we watch movies and we admire that stuff, don't we? I've always loved the line in Tombstone. Uh, where the guy says, well, to get to him, they're going to have to go through us. In other words, we've got it. To get to him, they'll have to go through us. And so sometimes friendship is being a warrior, you know. Um, but I think the main thing is not so much how the exact fight is going to be, but that you have in you the willingness to be a warrior for the things you know are properly yours to fight for. And it's a, it's a spirit. It's an attitude. Um, and it's one that I, I drank in uh, by being around a lot of military guys early in my life. And then as I got older, I was with a lot of really solid men of God, a lot of really solid uh, leaders. And, and I've always been next, very close to military culture because I, I speak a lot, do a lot in the military, lecture at the Naval Academy and so on. And so uh, all of that to say that, uh, that, that keeping that warrior spirit alive, even the books you read, uh, feeds into that. Uh, is really, really critical. And, and it's something that many men have to awaken because it's, they've been talked out of it in our, in our kind of cubicle, uh, docile, don't touch that kind of age. You know? All right, guys, wanted to take a quick second to tell you about the Iron Men Mastermind. If you're looking for a band of brothers that you can lock shields with, that can go to battle with you in the day-to-day -day life, who are also in the trenches, going through the same struggles and the same challenges that you are going through, I suggest you check out the Iron Man Mastermind. This mastermind was developed and designed for Christian men to help us become the men that God has created and called us to be. And it's designed to help us increase our relationship with God, increase our relationship with our wives, increase our relationship with our children and begin to provide better for them financially, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, relationally, in all of those areas, those areas that those things that wake you up in the middle of the night. These are the kinds of things that we work on. These are the kinds of ways that we can help you out in the Iron Man Mastermind. If this is something that is of interest to you, you may want to join the Iron Man community and you can check out more information at dadhackers.us slash Iron Men, one word, Iron Men there. All right, now back to our show. Mm -hmm. So you kind of hinted up at it a little bit in the beginning of your answer right there, but in the book, you talk about how true warriors contend for as well as against. Can you talk about that distinction a little bit? Yeah, I contend for things. I contend for the Kurds. I contend for justice in the world. I contend for uh, peace and against, uh, you know, for certain things. But then I contend against things as well. I contend against crime in my neighborhood if it's happening. Uh, I, can, I contend 
Um, a, a little old lady, I, I live in two downtown buildings, one in DC and one in Nashville. Little old ladies being oppressed by somebody, a couple of us men get together, we contend against that. We stand up against that guy. Um, I, I won't tell you the exact circumstances, but years ago, uh, I was informed that a man was beating his wife. Well, two or three of us showed up. We content, we made, we made it him, let him know. He continued doing that. He wouldn't be dealing with her. He'd be dealing with us. Now, that sounds all bold and bravado and ballsy, uh, but the fact is that that's what men do. Men step up. And if that guy had wanted to actually have it out physically, we would have done it because we were not going to let him beat his wife anymore. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, thump my chest and say that I'm Mr. Warrior here, but you have to be able to contend for and against uh, for positive things and against negative things. And you have to have the wisdom to know the difference. And it doesn't mean you're a brawler. It doesn't just mean you're macho. It doesn't mean you're picking a fight with a waiter, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, jumping out of your car at a, at a traffic stop because some guy cut you off. I mean, you're not that kind of idiot who's always looking for a fight. You're calm. You know, I got to tell you, when I was playing football, the guy who scared me the most was the polite, quiet guy on the other side <laughs> of the line. He was the one who was going to kick my backside, right? Uh, but the guy who was talking smack and I'm going to kick your butt and all I, mean, I just like, I ignored him because I was going to clean him out. So you don't want to be the idiot who's always looking for a fight. You want to calmly know who you are. You're going to know that you got warrior spirit in you. You're going to keep a warrior ethic in your life. You're going to have some skills, by the way, and some tools. And you're going to contend for and against the things that you ought to. But you contend for the good and against the evil is the short way to explain it. You also talk about the invisible battles men face. Can you talk to me about some of that as well? Yeah. Every man is going to fight an invisible battle for um, mastery over himself. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mind telling you that, that one of the things, I've said this publicly many times, um, one of the things I battle, I don't have any addictions. I don't have any, you know, no, no booze, no drugs, no porn. I don't have that kind of stuff. I do fight uh, in my soul um, letting go of offense. I, I, for whatever reason, maybe because I had a, a somewhat harsh father, who knows why, uh, I have a soul that's coated in Velcro and offenses stick. So I'm, throughout my life, uh, and this has certainly affected my spiritual life, and I've had, I've had to really work on this, um, I can get offended easily. Uh, I, I'm less, less there now than I was 20 years ago, but it's a factor. So that's an invisible war I have to fight. If you hadn't asked about it, you would not know. And if you were with me, you'd think, well, Steven's a pretty fun guy. It's, he's easy to get along with. But behind the scenes, you know, I'm being offended because whatever. I'm, I'm just making this up now because I wasn't invited to the party or because, you know, somebody said something harsh or criticized my big feet or who knows what. So there are that, there's that kind of internal invisible war fire thing you've got to battle for. Um, right now, for example, we're sitting, we're sitting here talking during the age of coronavirus. Um, and so men have got to contend for the culture in their home. I tell men to be the culture keepers in their home. So I'm fighting an invisible battle, not against anybody, but to keep a spirit of encouragement and hope. Uh, my wife and I certainly want to face the bad news and prepare for it. But at the same time, there's good news out there now. We're already seeing the back end of this coronavirus thing. The numbers, uh, the death numbers and so on aren't as bad. Uh, there are experts are coming out today. The head of the CDC today said the, uh, we have to revise the numbers downward. They're, they're not going to be near the number of deaths that we thought. Good news. You want to celebrate that? You want to raise a glass to that, right? So mm -hmm. what's that about? That's about me contending in my home for a certain culture. I don't want a culture of depression and death and, and uh, nervousness and fear. I want a culture of faith and a culture of heroism and a culture of vision and a culture of we're going to get out of this thing. When we come out of the cave, we're going to make a difference in the world. So that's, that's the kind of invisible thing you've got to fight. So I, I may have to, I've had to fight invisible battles in the hearts of my, my children, you know, certain things they go through or temptations they have. You know, my wife and I talk to each other all the time about everything from weight gain to bitterness to language that's dropping or who knows what, you know, I'm just making some of this up. But the point is that, that that's what you do. You fight invisible battles. And then there are, like I say, the visible ones where you, you know, you go confront the guy who's beating his wife and tell him if he wants to beat on somebody, he can beat on you and it won't be a happy experience for him because you, you've got to contend against the visible foe. But most of the invisible battles are spiritual, emotional. And those are, those are the fights men have got to fight as well. So in chapter three, this is, this is the fire of destiny. You talk about this idea that a lot of men have this, this nagging sense, maybe in the back of their head, that they were created for something more, that there's more to life, that they, they're called to a bigger thing than what's currently going on in their life or what they're currently pursuing. Can, can you speak to that somewhat? 
Yeah, I, I believe, of course, I'm a Christian, so I believe that men are made with a destiny. Uh, I believe we are all created for a purpose, that we come from the womb with a purpose that God has set. And if we live less than that, if we don't know that destiny, if we don't take hold of that, for which, you know, using scripture, uh, for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of us, um, then we're going to feel frustrated. We're going to feel less than. Um, I believe that men need to think in terms of what they were made for. Uh, even my non-Christian friends or my Christian, my friends who are not of some other religion uh, still think in terms of an, or, of an, of an ordained path, of a, of a way chosen for them. Um, and so we've got we've to think about that. We've got we've to try to align our lives as best we can uh, with what was chosen for us. So um, men are made for every kind of thing. The, the, word, the word destiny is not a code word for being president of the United States or the king or always some great famous person. Or you know, um, uh, People are destined to do all kinds of things. People are destined to be accountants and people are destined to own construction companies and people are destined to teach and all kinds of things we're called to do. But the issue is that you do them. The issue is that you realize that the same God who made you male also gave a purpose to your life and you want to pray and strive as best you can uh, for uh, fulfilling that purpose. You want to take hold of that for which you were created. And I think that's where true joy comes from. I think that's where true impact comes from. Um, and again, I want to say very carefully, I, I'm a guy who works against the idea that destiny means you have to be famous or rich. Destiny is doing whatever you're made for. Um, Bev and I had some brickwork done some years ago. And, um, and when we looked down at the brickwork this, this guy had done, we both teared up. It was absolutely beautiful. I mean, it, was a, it was a simple little brick pattern in the backyard, but it was absolutely beautiful. And we thought, this guy is made to lay brick. I mean, this is what he's made. He's made to be an artist with brick. Well, in our kind of pop culture, motivational culture, a lot of people wouldn't recognize that skill, but that guy is made to do artistry in that way. And, and we were celebrating it. So all, all of that to say, one of the arts of living is realizing that there's an order already established for you and a purpose already established for you and do the best you can to get in line with it. Uh, because that's where you're going to find joy. That's where you're going to meet God in your professional life. Uh, that's where you're going to find all of your pistons firing, so to speak. Yeah, I think that's important for guys to understand on kind of two fronts. Number one, understanding that your life has value, has meaning, has purpose, and you didn't just evolve from a rock, you know, you're, right. you, you have a divine path set before you. And, and number two, that what you're doing is important and yes. is impactful and that you can pursue great things. And I, I like how you included that you don't have to be rich and famous to live out your destiny. Cause no. I, I think that's the, the culturally defined idea of what destiny is or being successful, but not at all, man. No, destiny is simply a prior plan, and you fulfilling your destiny is you getting in line with that prior plan. And so, you know, thank God that right now there are people who work in obscurity to develop medical devices, to become nurses and doctors. Nobody's, they're not famous. They might be a little bit more famous now as the cameras turn on them, but I mean, they were working away in obscurity. Um, but thank God they did. And thank God that most of them will never be known, but they're, they're saving the world from this coronavirus situation. Um, when I can, all I can do is sit here and read a book to it. <laughs> you know, I don't have those skills. So that's, that's part that's one of the arts of living. And I, and I, and it's important for everybody to hear because a lot of guys, you know, the evolutionary message that we have in most of our schools and most of our philosophy is that basically you're an accident. Basically you're an accident. Well, if you're an accident, then what difference does it make how you live? Rape, pillage, rob, steal, get drunk, get high, do whatever. What difference does it make? It's all survival of the fittest. But of course, that's a false philosophy. We all know that. But the, the issue is God loves you. God's got a plan for your life. He's got a purpose for your life. And you ought to get in line with it because that's where life's going to come together for you. And that's a, that's a message men need to hear. Yeah, and I think also another big consequence of that line of thinking that, that we just evolved from something in your life is meaningless. I think that eventually if you draw it, run it out to its logical conclusion results in, in a lot of depression and a, a lot of l suicide, I, I would say, because what purpose does your life have? What's the difference if, if you live right or live wrong? What's the difference if you get out of bed exactly. or not? And I'll tell you something else if I may go there for just for a moment. Sure. You know, we have a lot of magazine values in our lives, meaning that the magazines tell us, oh, when you get married, life is going to change. It's going to be awesome. Or when you buy this certain motorcycle, 
or when you take a certain vacation to release or whatever. And so what happens is they set us up for these thinking that we're going to be transformed by these experiences in life. Well, some, many times they're not as exciting as we think. Um, and so if we don't take hold of God and our purpose in life and live that out nobly, um, then we're going to be looking for these natural experiences. I'm going to tell you, no steak is going to change your life. No <laughs> vacation is going to transform you forever. And I love being married. Don't hear me being cynical or negative about being married. But marriage is work. Um, and, you know, marriage is, in my, as I often say humorously, is two centers under the same roof. Um, and so you got to work stuff out. So if you think marriage is going to just be some kind of, you know, luscious breath novel for the rest of your life, you're crazy. This works and it takes some hammering and some methods and some communicating. I'm not trying to rob you of all the experiences of life, but if we just go by magazine values, every experience should be awesome and amazing. And often it's not. Well, that makes you just want to put a bullet through your brain. If all you're doing is living from sensation to sensation, that's not going to fulfill you. There's not enough food, booze, boats, cars, motorcycles, sex, whatever in movies in the world. Uh, to fill the hole on the inside of you unless you're first connected to God and unless you are first taking hold of your destiny. So that's another reason that I emphasize that. Yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that, that I hit, hit on this and then I want to talk about the fire of legacy really quick before we wrap things up. But in that chapter on destiny, you, you quoted the verse from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And this is a verse that is very crucial in my life, gives me a lot of hope and, and really helps to center me that, that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God p prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Um, and you pointed out, and I thought this was really neat, how the, the work, the word for handiwork in the original Greek language meant a work of art. And yeah. I just thought that totally just exploded that verse even more for me in yeah. understanding that little nugget. Well, it's a powerful term. Uh, the Greek word is poema. Uh, we get our word poem from it, but it means a carefully crafted work, crafted work of art. And that's what I would like to say to you know every man listening to your podcast here, uh, is that every man has been made and woven by God. And that, and that verse goes on to say, for works that have been chosen, prepared in advance. There are things that, you're, that are prepared in advance for you to do. So not only are you a beautiful artwork, and I know that men have a hard time identifying, well, I'm a work of art, but I mean, you know, how you want to say it, you're awesome, you're chiseled, you're, you know, you're, yeah. uh, you're, you're fashion, you're great, you're prepared. Um, you got some things to learn. You got some things you got to get out of your life. You got some things you've got to improve in, some skills you've got to acquire. Um, but, but God is in the process of doing that. And by the way, there are works prepared in advance for you to do. And that's exciting. That, that makes me want to roar after life um, rather than just hang out and go from meal to meal and sensation to sensation and movie to movie and just entertaining myself to death. I want to do something. I want to have an impact. I want to make a difference in the world. I want to live what I was made for. And then when I die, I want to look God in the face and say, hey, I, I, I took hold of what you made me for and have him be happy about that. So all that to say, um, that's, I'm really glad you put your finger on that verse because that's a powerful one for me. Mm. 210, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the top verses in my life. So one final question before we start wrapping it up. Sure. You have the chapter on legacy. What does it mean to leave a legacy? And I want to ask this question because th this is one of the driving forces behind Dad Hackers, that we become the men that God has designed us to be so that we can leave a legacy of not just that our children will become Christians, but that we leave a legacy of multi-generational faithfulness. And so I, I really was interested in, in your idea and understanding of legacy. Well, thank you for asking that. Part of the art of being a man is that you don't just think in terms of your generation and the impact you have in your time, but that you think in terms of what you are putting into the future, mm -hmm. uh, what you are embedding into the lives of your children, uh, what you are leaving that will survive you. Um, it's not a contest. It's not an ego thing. Um, but every man is made to leave a legacy. And it's, 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 I, it's, I, I've, I've been in some situations where I've been with men at their death. And some men are able to say, I'm content. I have embedded my life into my children. I have built some institutions. I've done some things that will keep on giving into the next generation. I've written a shelf of books. Whatever it is that's going to survive them. And other men come to the last years of their life and realize they've done nothing that's going to survive them. And they die in torment. I'm sorry to say it. So what I want to say positively is that every man 
is made to leave a legacy. That doesn't mean you've left some big account at a university or something like that, unless that's what you're called to do. Uh, but it means mainly that amongst those that you have influence with, your wife, your children, uh, your friends, the next generation, that you have embedded so in something that's going to survive you. Um, and so men are meant to live that way. Men are meant to think that way. Women think a little less that way. Uh, they think in terms of security and to making sure we're covering the kids' college and, you know, uh, all that kind of thing. And that's, that's fine. They're meant to. But men are, meant to, men are designed to think a little further out, thinking beyond their life. Um, and, you know, we all know that in those of us who read the Bible, that in Scripture, a man is actually condemned who said, look, I know horrible things are about to happen, but I'll have peace and security in my lifetime. He was only concerned about his lifetime and what was going on in his lifetime. Instead, he was supposed to be the curator, the caretaker of a legacy that was to be passed on to the next generation. So that's the way a man's meant to think. Now, see, here's an example of something you got to teach men that they're not, that, that really their fathers should teach them. And if they don't, we've got to teach them which is you're not going to feel fully whole. You're not going to feel fully fulfilled. Uh, you're not going to be able to leave this life fully content until you have left a legacy, uh, something deposited in the next generation that lives on and perhaps lives on for generations after that. And when you describe that to men, they go, of course, that's how I've, I'm made. But, the, but they're just waking up to it. They've never been told before. And then they roar after it. So it's a powerful concept and something that's one of the great arts of being a man. Well, Stephen, man, it's been a great honor to be able to speak with you today. And we're, we're going to unfortunately have to wrap things up now. I mean, we could talk for a lot, lot longer about all of these things. If somebody wants to get a hold of your book, uh, when's the release date? And what's the best way to start engaging with your content, where to go uh, to see what all you're doing? Great. My personal website is stephenmansfield.tv. Just my name spelled with a P-H on stephen.tv. We have a site for men called greatman.tv. You want to check that out, greatman.tv. We've got Great Man Twitter feed, Great Man TV Twitter feed. And you can go on Amazon now um, and go ahead and pre-purchase pre the book, and it'll come to you as soon as it comes out. It won't be out for a few weeks yet. Um, but when it comes out, we're, we're going we're to do some exciting things with it. We're going to do some conferences. The book is designed specifically for, uh, for conferences and retreats and men's events. We're going to do a lot of those. Um, but check us out, greatman.tv and then greatman TV Twitter feed, and you'll find out what we're doing. Good. And don't forget, guys, we're giving away a free copy of this book. We're having a contest for that. And to be entered into it, make sure you share this episode on social media, tag myself, tag, tag dad hackers, and make sure you uh, follow Steven and tag him as well to get entered into it. And we will do the drawing a week after this episode is released. Now, Steven, one final question. I like to ask all my guests this. Sure. And of course, this is the Dad Hackers podcast. We haven't talked specifically or pointedly about fatherhood very much. So one final question. In your opinion, Stephen, what makes a great dad? What makes a great dad is that he narrates life for his children. I talk about life. I open my heart. I open my mind. I tell them what's going on in the world. I, my kids are older. They're either side of 30. Um, but even yet, I narrate life to them. I open my heart. I describe what's going on around me. I discuss things in terms of God and in terms of noble manhood and so on. And so even though my kids are older, uh, I've done this their whole life. And so there are obviously other skills you got to have. you got to learn how to make nickels disappear behind their ears, and you got to learn how to buy milkshakes that you're not supposed to really buy and all that kind of stuff. But for me, it was the fact that I narrated the world. As my kids and I went through the world, um, I would narrate them. Well, that's how a man lives. You know, God does that kind of thing. Or look at that. Isn't that interesting? I'm not sure you want to really live that way. You know, that kind of stuff. And we'd have discussions, and I'd welcome them into the discussions. And so when my kids went out in the world, they were, they were ready because I had – I had walked with them, so to speak, in understanding the world. I think that's one of the essential arts. All right, brother. Very good. Well, Stephen, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. It was an honor to speak with you and uh, good luck with the release of your book. And um, I'm excited to devour the second half of it, man. Man, it's great to be with you. Thank you. Great job. All right. Thanks for all you do, brother. Take care. You bet. All right, gentlemen, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope our conversation was a blessing to you and that you leave this episode better equipped to be the man and the father God has called and created you to be. If so, then I ask that you please leave us a five-star rating and a quick written review in iTunes. 
then make sure you head on over to the show notes to get all of the resources for this episode. While you're there, you can take part in our five days to be a better dad challenge, as well as get involved with our free Facebook community. All right, gentlemen, until next week, remember Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Stay sharp.